Good afternoon, you all. Thank you very much, Amal, for the kind introduction. Uh, when I was asked to see whether I can talk something here, I have to choose the topic lymphedema because that is uh, seen mostly in our clinical scenarios, but its management is still evolving. Uh, it's at very basic level at the moment, the management of lymphedema. And uh, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of uh, people in different fields for its management. So I don't think we are doing a correct management of lymphedema in this um, country. Very few centers are dealing with lymphedema. In other countries, if you see, there are very dedicated centers for management of lymphedema because that is evolving. So we will just see what I am going to, I am not going to talk anything very serious here. I am going to talk to uh, you on very basics of lymphedema so that you all can read and get ready for your exams or whatever or clinical practice. Right? right. So we will see what the definition is now. There are various definitions but commonly used definition is localized swelling caused by a compromised lymphatic system. So swelling is localized. So we do not see generalized lymphedema. So if you get generalized ed edema, that is something else. So lymphedema is generally localized, either to one limb, part of the limb, maybe two limbs, uh, maybe two lower limbs, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's a chronic and progressive disease. It is not like a hernia; it comes, cut, and get rid of it. But it's not. This is not like that. It's a chronic disease. It's progressive and debilitating, and it is not curable. But uh, the treatment modalities we can use to improve the outcome, right? So it is not curable. So that means you need to be with the patient on a long term basis, right? Very lifelong uh, treatment is needed to get it under control, right? And generally, very commonly, we see it after complication of cancer treatment like carcinoma of the breast or, or gynecolo gynecological surgeries and also after para uh, parasitic in infections and all and rarely we see certain genetic disorders causing lymphedema. So we should understand the physiology of lymphatic flow before starting treatment that is the basis of treatment right. Physiology is now you know uh, from the arteries when the blood flows to the veins at the finest tributaries of the vascular system, you get filtration, that is called ultrafiltration. So the ultrafiltrated <coughs> fluid, sorry, contains, is a high uh, protein content, lot of debris, cellular debris and um, sometimes bacteria and all and uh, a fluid, those are the three components of ultrafiltration. So generally what happens is that ultrafiltrated fluid is taken into the uh, small, uh, smallest branches of the lymphatic system. That is, uh, you know, you may remember your histology days, uh, they are blind ended uh, fenestrated tubes. They are seen in, in between cells. So they are taken into the uh, fenestrated tubules, then they guide along their branches becoming bigger and bigger. And if you get the smaller uh, uh, lymphatics, they do have valves, they are rudimentary valves and they become go into bigger veins, their valves are well formed like in a vein, they are well formed valves. So there is unidirectional flow of lymph from the 
fenestrated uh, in, uh, blind in the tubules to bigger veins and then the flow is by rhythmic peristaltic like movements they, they have peristaltic movements um, in the lymphatic uh, channels and they are guided by uh, sympathetic uh, the nervous system the sympathetic uh, output is needed to maintain its peristaltic movement so any condition which uh, disturbs the sympathetic flow that patient can end up with um, lymphedema like somebody following a trivial trauma they sometimes end up with lymphedema you may see patients who are coming to the clinics they have lymphedema but no significant uh, trauma right so those are the patients they have sympathetic you may have heard of a thing called sympathetic dystrophy where you get stiffness edema in the hand following minor surgeries so, so similarly this is guided by the sympathetic nervous system right and also it is aided by the muscular action so if it is in the calf the calf muscle is helping to pump lymph back to the towards the heart and also arterial pulse pressure around the lymphatics and also the negative thoracic pressure so all these influence lymphatic flow towards the chest where they end up in major veins right but the primary source of um, lymphatic flow is by peristaltic movement of the lymphatics the other part contributes very little but that is also significant then the, the lymph flows to the lymph nodes where they, the, the bacteria and debris are removed and they ultimately end up with the right thoracic uh, light uh, lymph lymphatic duct or thoracic duct so when you talk about the lymphatic system the critical uh, portion of the immune system is handled by the lymphatics and it maintains a balance between the interstitial fluid and the intravascular fluid right and uh, and also it maintains nutrition to the cells in the tissues those are the three main functions of the lymphatic system so how do they get how do we get lymphedema the pathophysiology so if there is impaired drainage of lymphatic fluid either due to uh, damage to the foam lymphatics the lymphatics may have formed well but later on they can get damaged or blocked right or else they may have formed at the very beginning like congenita right so in such a situation what happens is the ultra filtrated fluid which is rich in protein they get accumulated in the tissues so they lead to an inflammatory reaction in the tissue the proteins will initiate an inflammatory tissue reaction which becomes chronic then there will be adipocytes get activated then it lays uh, fat in the tissues for the fat uh, loading and then connective tissues will be overgrown and there is uh, later on with several stages they end up with irreversible in duration and severe fibrosis of the limb that's what happens how the lymphedema progresses to the ultimate uh, result of like elephantiasis uh, then um, we'll talk the later part later so how are you going to diagnose when the patient present they will present with a swollen limb they come with swollen limb the limb will be that is the presentation swollen limb limb swelling so there are so many causes where a limb can swell up so our aim is to diagnose lymphedema the diagnosis is done by mostly clinically it's a clinical diagnosis and we use certain investigations to exclude other causes of leg edema for example dvt so we want to exclude from dvt you use maybe duplex scan to find out whether there is dvt or not so lymphedema diagnosis basically clinical by excluding other causes right so they come with limb swelling so initial uh, when the lymphedema starts we may not notice any swelling there the patient might come to us with heaviness they will come and tell heavy limb so to go ma apu api thi muladi ganang ganne ane yandamma gihilla ge bida ganne kiyala gedare yawano that is the initiation of lymphedema so to avoid missing the diagnosis we should not let them go we should follow them up we should review them maybe in few weeks time few months time we should follow up follow up is very important to reach a diagnosis because initial presentation is not noticeable but patient has uh, heaviness in the limb right so then after some time they develop edema soft tissue swelling which will be which will we can notice with further time they get skin changes the skin becomes discolored then they develop wart like lesions and their skin become hyperplastic 
hyperkeratotic, then they develop papillomas, and then also they get dermal thickening. That is the last stages of the disease. And also they can present with complications of lymphedema. That, what I told you the natural history, what happens to the lymphedema, but in, in between intermittently they can get other complications like infections, erysipelas, cellulitis, sometimes they end up with ulcers and very rarely they end up with lymphangiosarcomas. There is a syndrome called Stuart Travis syndrome, those who are interested you can read about them. Um, I know some doctors are very interested in reading syndromes. So, you can put this into your collection and ultimately the problem is the disfigurement and the physiological stress. So, somebody with lymphedema is very difficult, they have a lot of social stick, social issues. You see some patients coming with very long gowns and trousers to just to cover it because the people look at that, uh, so they don't like it. So again the diagnosis by symptoms and signs, uh, the we need to take a thorough history and exam, uh, we have to thoroughly examine the patient and just to objectively assess the swelling, we may do limb measurements, there are certain ways of doing limb measurements, uh, various gadgetics are available. One thing is limb circumference, when you measure the limb circumference, you have to exactly uh, choose one point of the legs. Uh, using a bony prominence, the bony prominence are very stable. So you need to choose either medial malleolus, lat malleolus, lateral malleolus, or maybe fibular head. You choose one, and from that point you take down and make a measurement, and you chart it. That is very useful to compare with the other limb, right? So always you compare with the other limb. You know the god has given two each for us to compare. Two eyes, two nose. Always make a habit of comparing with the normal side. Otherwise you miss the diagnosis most of the time. Therefore, you compare with the other side, is there a difference between like more than 4 centimeters you can consider as significant, while well, less than 2 to 4 centimeters are borderline, but if it is more than 4 centimeters that is significant, that is significant swelling, edema in the limb. And there is another uh, measurement called bioimpedance measurement, I will just show you later, that is a uh, measurement of muscle mass and the uh, fat mass or fluid volume in the body that is used to uh, calculate the body mass index also uh, objectively. And then we uh, do investigations as I said to rule out other conditions like heart failure, renal failure and so on. So we, there are various imaging techniques to do on patients with lymphedema but they are reserved for patients who are supposed to undergo surgical intervention because otherwise you are not going to gain anything if the lymphedema is diagnosed with uh, clinical evidence, then no pointing again doing a test to confirm it. If you are excluded other conditions, the lymphedema is there. We do not do these uh, 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 minimally invasive uh, things to confirm this unless we are planning for surgical intervention. There are stages where we do surgical intervention. In those patients, we do imaging like one thing is lymphocyntigraphy and, and other one is endocyanin green lymphography. Those are uh, high tech uh, investigations which are not available, I do not know in national hospital, um, I do not think so. This is the uh, gadget which is used to check the uh, impedance, you, you know there is a small gadget there, uh, they pass an electric current and calculate the surface area and you know there is a hi-fi uh, way of calculating it, that is used to confirm whether there is lymphedema or not. So, when you examine a patient with uh, a lymphedematous leg, so you need to, now you have clinical suspicion, then you examine, you, when you examine you need to look for complications of lymphedema, then you have to look for evidence of other diseases which can cause limb swelling. So, you have to look for color, color of the limb. So, if the patient is having arterial insufficiency, the limb may be pale when you compare with the other side. because peripheral vascular disease patient also can present with edema of the limb, edematous limb. So you look at the color, right, then the presence of hair in the leg. So patient with peripheral vascular disease will have, may not have hair in the leg, will show evidence of peripheral ischemia, right. So you look at the hair, then visible veins in the patient is varicose veins, you may see visible veins, a varicose vein presentation also at the beginning will be edema of the leg, that is not lymphedema, that is edema. Then you see the size of the limb 
to compare with other sites and to follow up the patient and look for complications like ulcerations and pulses again to look for uh, evidence of vascular disease. The palpating pulses may not be easy in a patient who has significant edema, but you need to try that. When you feel pulses in a patient with lymphedema, it is early. First attempt, you may not feel pulse, but you need to keep pressure for some time to to a stage where it pits. When it is the pit is formed, then you can feel pulses easily. If it is pit at the pitting stage, if the stage has gone to non-pitting edema, then feeling pulses will be not easy. Then always look for lymph nodes. The edematous limb, somebody coming to you, never ignore lymph nodes. So somebody may come with a small foot swelling, right? Always go back to the groin, examine the groin, go back to the abdomen, examine the abdomen in addition to the other systems. This is the this is a thing which we miss most of the time. Always when we examine something, you have to go forward and backwards. Right? If you see a lump at the elbow, look at the distal part of the hand, whether there is any neurological deficit, whether there is discoloration, and go back to the axilla and look for axillary lymph nodes. If you go and further go back, you may look for liver and spleen. This is particularly important for malignancies. Right? Always when you examine something, don't have a tunnel vision. Open your eyes, go forward and backwards, forward and backward. Then you are not going to miss the diagnosis. So abdominal examination, digital rectal examination, and vaginal examination. Sometimes pelvic pathologies can present with lymphedema. Then we will talk about the causes for lymphedema. So lymphedema causes, there are two mainly. The primary lymphedema that is due to uh, maldevelopment or absent lymphatics or lymph nodes. They are born with that. And secondary lymphedema is the one, the lymphatics are formed very well, they live normal life and after some time due to a pathological process or due to trauma, they later on get lymphedema. That is the secondary lymphedema. So if we go more into more details of primary causes, as I said that is due to functional anomaly. So those who are having primary lymphedema they may not, that may not be evident during with birth in some patients, they appear later. So that if it is present during birth, that is a congenital lymphedema. Sometimes it appears later in the life, maybe in adolescent life, that is called lymphedema precox, right. So they have a normal life during childhood and adolescence they appear, nobody knows why that is. And in some patients, they have a normal life further during adulthood, they develop lymphedema. That is called lymphedema tarda, right? So, congenital lymph, uh, the, the, the primary lymphedema may be present at birth. They may not appear during birth, they may appear later in the life. So, that is, and there are certain uh, conditions where primary lymphedema is associated with various syndromes. So, those are some of the syndromes which have name here. So again, you can write down and later on you can read what these syndromes are, right? And you should not forget that primary lymphedema may be associated with vascular malformation. So if you see one congenital anomaly, you need to look for others. Similarly, a patient with lymphedema can have other vascular, that is commonly associated with vascular anomalies other than the other congenital anomalies. So secondary lymphedema causes that I said born with normal lymphatic then they are damaged by due to something else. So one thing is surgery. So during surgery especially we are very careful when you are dissecting the groins like for varicose vein surgeries. So dissect the groin to look for uh, saphirofemoral junction and then look for the tributaries we need. Lot, we do lot of dissection there. That is the area where all the lymphatics are concentrated which are coming from the lower limb. If you damage them with over dissection what happens is they develop lymphedema at one time of their life. That may be present immediately during the ward stay, they come later on. Especially if the surgery is a recurrent one, if the patient has undergone SF ligation some time back, if you are going to do re redo the surgery, there is a high risk of ending up with lymphedema. Sometimes the patient come with pouring lymph through the groin goon, that is due to destruction of the uh, lymphatics and the lymph nodes in the groin. So that is a uh, secondary lymphedema. Then the radiotherapy. So you do mastectomy sometimes you radiotherapy to the axilla. So it, they have a very high risk of ending up. And parasitic infection like filariasis, it's a well known. 
and that is the uh, area where they have done a lot of studies on lymphedema and if somebody gets recurrent cellulitis so the patient has normal lymphatics but uh, a patient with diabetes cracked heels uh, then uh, fungal infections in the webs they get recurrent cellulitis each with each attack of cellulitis it destroys some lymphatic channels and after some time they end up with lymphedema therefore treating such patients early detection of those patients and treating them vigorously at the earliest possible chance will reduce the incidence of lymphedema in those patients right then um, trauma again either due to direct trauma or else maybe indirect trauma with no major trauma they end up with cellulitis again due to sympathetic effect right and it is associated with obesity as well there is a condition just to mention that is bilateral uh, lower extremity inflammatory lymphedema it's a very rare condition just to know the name uh, that is seen in some patients who are standing for long hours right that is thought to be due to venous congestion leading to uh, inflammatory vasculitis that is a rare condition but just knowing the name uh, is enough inflammatory is an inflammatory condition it's a secondary lymphedema type of secondary lymphedema so out of those i mentioned <coughs> i'm just concentrating again on axillary dissection and radiotherapy after mastectomy which is commonly done either radiotherapy or axillary dissection they have a 40 to 90% chance of end ending up with lymphedema of the upper limb that lymphedema will may or may not be present immediately that sometime they appear later again once that is set in treatment is very very difficult therefore uh, nowadays we try to avoid axillary clearance uh, what we do is you find out the uh, tumor and see whether there are multiple uh, uh, synchronous lesions in the breast with a mammogram you exclude that if the lesion is single you we do wide local excision and we do sentinel lymph node biopsy so we uh, inject methylene blue or various dyes are there for injection and then trace the axillary lymph node and take the first group of lymph nodes so one or two lymph nodes only uh, and then we send it for analysis histological analysis pathological analysis and if it shows deposit then we may go for axillary clearance if there is negative we can avoid axillary dissection so that we can avoid or reduce the incidence of upper limb edema and also don't forget patients uh, following mastectomy uh, we should always advise them not to wear uh, tight garments where there is lymphatic obstruction some people wear this um, hat uh, with uh, this thing uh, bands elastic band like thing so that will precipitate lymphedema cannulation of that particular upper limb is contraindicated for venous access and bp cuff, cuff apparatus application is contraindicated so please make sure that if a patient comes to you uh, following mastectomy or radiotherapy do not apply anything uh, to that arm just leave it free that will reduce the chances of lymphedema then after gynecological surgery there's 40% chance of developing lower limb edema lymphedema and tamoxifen again uh, causes lymphedema uh, the exact mechanism is not known but it is thought to be due to formation of microemboli in venous hypertension and then uh, back pressure causing some some kind of lymphedema but tamoxifen is known to cause lymphedema though it is not very common so how are you diagnosed clinically uh, as i said before the early stages uh, diagnosis very difficult uh, i have so said both of these things uh, in my previous slides So these are the other conditions which mimic early lymphedema as chronic venous stasis can mimic lymphedema right if you do a venous duplex we will be able to find out the presence of valvular incompetence you know dilated veins and incompetent perforators there is a condition called lipedema which is not lymphedema like lipid collection of lipids uh, in the leg it also mimics lymphedema but uh, interestingly it does not affect the foot foot is perfectly normal just above the ankle you get edema that is called lipedema uh, if it affects the hand it spares uh, upper limb it spares the hand span hand is perfectly normal just above the wrist they get 
edema that is called lipedema um, it's a very rare condition but clinically we can easily diagnose that by using that particular physical sign then other conditions you know all these things uh, and in the breast now lymphedema can occur anywhere like you can if you do head and neck surgery lymph node dissection head and neck radiotherapy they get lymphedema in the head and neck if you do uh, axilla they may get lymphedema in the breast so lymphedema when it comes in the breast you get powder and appearance right powder and appearance is edema of the dermis you know how powder and appearance comes you know they have follicles are there that those areas like are uh, remain they remain like dimples and the rest swells up then you get powder and appearance then the stemma sign is the sign uh, where you do i will show a slide later on regarding that and we always should be uh, able to uh, differentiate uh, lymphedema from inflammatory edema you say sometimes after a trivial trauma like a sprain you get edema of the leg uh, ankle then you don't call it lymphedema that is due to gross inflammation so say you fall and you get a ligamental injury so there is inflammatory reaction which will happen in the vicinity that causes hyperdynamic circulation and it le leads to leakage of lot of interstitial fluid into the interstitium so that load the, no, the normal lymphatics cannot cope up therefore they get edema so that is not called lymphedema that is inflammatory edema that is a temporary thing that will settle down with time few after few weeks that will settle down that is why but if you don't treat it properly they can end up with lymphedema therefore a patient who has edematous limb as a very early stage you need to start treatment so elevation physical activities compression bandages those things should be initiated at the very beginning because before it becomes a chronic lymphedema so uh, traumatic edema which is not lymphedema can become a chronic lymphedema if you don't uh, uh, treat them properly so compression bandage is very important i just want to highlight one point we should never apply circumferential bandages to the limb proximal for any reason so if the patient is having say a thigh wound you should never apply a crepe bandage there into the thigh it that definitely blocks all the lymphatics it blocks the veins the patient can get dvt the patient can get lymphedema i have seen deaths following varicose vein stripping which was done in the thigh a crepe bandage has been applied to the thigh only because below knee nothing was done three days later patient got the cardiac arrest a young patient died and post mortem showed embolization dvt embolization that is purely due to the crepe bandage which was applied to the thigh so therefore please do not apply circumferential bandages uh, never do that right if you apply a circumferential bandage that should be started at the root of the toes kapuli atam idala udata daagana enda puluwa but not proximally never never ever so you can use a plaster again which is not circumferential longitudinal plaster that will not block lymphatics or veins so this is a common mistake we do one thing is due to maybe due to lack of knowledge or sometimes due to lack of bandages so if the bandages are not is not available you put a plaster just not circumferential right so the rest of the leg should be free so this is the stemma sign you can see that uh, if you can pinch that yeah in a patient with lymphedema you can't pinch that area it is in the hand you can't pinch here so i i have no lymphedema i have no fat also but <laughs> no lymphedema here right you can pinch there you can pinch there uh, the, there is lymphedema you can't bring the uh, this thing together that is called stemma sign right this is the lipedema patient which i talked to you before you can see the leg feet are very nice normal but sharp but this stage going up there is edema all are lip, lipedema various stages all feet are normal but in a patient with lymphedema you don't get lymphedema here sparing here right so there is lymphedema at the lymphatic obstruction here you get everything di, uh, edema just below that right this is lipedema it's a spot diagnosis so management again there is no cure i said at the beginning the treatment can improve so aim of treatment aims are uh, one thing is we have to re reduce the edema reduction of the edema then we have to maintain that so with various treatment modalities now say you massaging bandaging will reduce edema 
but you can't wait after that. If you stop treatment, they come back again because lymphatics are obstructed. Now you do various maneuvers to get rid of that fluid. And if you remove that treatment or the pressure bandaging or massaging, that comes back again, that becomes chronic. That is why lymphedema treatment is lifelong. It, patients need compliance, dedication, it is not easy. So the first thing when you do, when you treat a patient lymphedema is, you have a long chat with the patient and educate the patient that this is not going to be just bandaging and stopping. It is going to be lifelong, patient has to sacrifice a lot of time to do the massaging and things on the patients on their own. So you have to motivate them, otherwise no point in starting treatment, right. So then you find if there is a correctable course, you correct the course like maybe filariasis. Then uh, you need to prevent complications, cellulitis, ulceration and all. And if there are complications, you oh, treat, you know, then that is the general thing. Uh, the, the, the aims of uh, treating a patient with lymphedema, right? Reduction of edema, correction of the course, prevention of complication and treatment of the complication. So always you have to try to identify it as I said before. Then once you diagnose lymphedema, you grade it like any other disease. You can grade, you can stage, even for malignancies that is what we do. So with grading and staging, we can choose the correct modality of treatment then you can follow the patient up to see the prognosis or the outcome of the treatment, right. So the rough grading is like in centimeters you measure, you may take a tape and measure it and document that, what is the circumference now today, right, at this particular level to make a diagram and point, uh, point out and draw it. So that during next visit, you know whether your treatment is working or not. If the circumference is increasing, then your treatment is not working, then you need to go for another modality of treatment. So that is very important. So grade 1 less than 4 centimeters, 2, 4 to 6 and grade 3, that is a rough uh, um, measurement which we can use in our clinical practice. Then there is a staging system also, a bit of a complicated staging system that was uh, developed by the 5th WHO Expert Committee on Filariasis endorsed by American Lymphology Association, uh, that there are 8, eight stages. So, 0 to 7, 0 to 7 there are uh, 8 stages, uh, I will, I just highlighted few just for your information, uh, this 0 is um, lymphatics are damaged but they know edema, the lymphatics damage but no edema, right, then it goes on like that and when it comes to stage 7, they are handicapped, they can't get out of the bed, they are bedridden, so up to that stage they can go like lymphedema, when it is massive, they are just bedridden. It's a very handicapping disease. So these are the various stages of the disease. You can see stage 1, it's not great stage 0, that stage 0 is not, you can't detect like this, this is stage 1, slight swelling and it goes on like that. So various, there are a lot of parameters you can use to uh, stage the disease like amount of pitting, amount of softness and various things are considered, but this is a um, this is how it is staged. So once the disease is set in, how I go to prevent, it is a progressive disease, I told it is not curable. If you leave it untreated, that progresses up to an end stage. So how I going to stop progression of the disease? So you have to target the treatment. If you can find the etiology, you have to target that, right? Always we should encourage them to keep the limb elevated. It is very difficult thing to do but you need to emphasize the importance of elevation so that gravity will help the lymphatic flow. So when they are sleeping, if the leg is uh, involved, advise them to keep the leg on 2-3 pillows. So if it is upper limb, advise them to keep the upper limb elevated all the time, right. It is very important especially after mastectomies when we discharge patients, uh, that is the responsibility of us to um, tell the patient what to do at home, right. And always you should avoid proximal obstruction of lymphatic flow, I told you before bandages and BP cuff and so on, right. Uh, then we should avoid injuries. Now, uh, lymphedematous limb, if you get a small abrasion, they are at high risk of ending up with infections. One thing is their stasis, it's a protein rich fluid in the interstitial. Lymphatic system is not working, lymphatic system is the 
policemen in the area which is not working so they end up with uh, rapidly spreading infection with each infection the remaining uh, few lymphatics are, are also uh, become damaged so they 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 become worse like a vicious circle so uh, when you diagnose it you have to at the very beginning treat it vigorously Mm, and it is a multidisciplinary approach. One person can't treat lymphedema. There are so many people, nurses involved, physiotherapists are involved. So, so many uh, people are involved with uh, lymphedema management. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Are beautiful, no? Where the flowers are there. I just put it to wake up those who are sleeping. But sleeping is allowed, right? So no problem. Okay. So, what are the types of management available for lymphedema? So, lymphedema, once it is diagnosed, we, to, we have to do something, no? we have to manage it. So, managing, I said, uh, there are two. One thing is conservative management, other one is surgical management. So, conservative management is done uh, without intervention, you do not do intervention. So, the surgical management has a lot of complications and so on. Therefore, try to manage it conservatively. So, conservative management, the primary management is combined decongestion therapy. Combined decongestion therapy that involves manual drainage therapy, that is massaging, right? Then it involves exercises, regular exercises like jogging or whatever. And daily bandaging, daily bandaging. And you have to do skin care. That, that all together is called combined decongestion or decongestive therapy that is the mainstay of management of uh, lymphedema non-surgical so again uh, you reduce edema and maintain edema the phase one phase two phase one is you uh, reduce edema by various means of uh, compression bandages and exercises then we need to maintain that if you don't maintain that comes back it bounces back no 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 doubt right Therefore, we do maintain. So, main, it is the maintenance which is the difficult part. It needs a lot of time and sacrifice. It needs strong patient compliance, lifelong comp compression garment, and it is very costly, you know, a lot of time and resources are wasted. And uh, diuretics are not working for lymphedema patients. Uh, it is not proven. Uh, some use it, but uh, it is not, uh, not useful. So, just a word about compression therapy that is a mainstay of treatment. So, you do elastic compression therapy, you do bandaging. In other countries, it is called wrapping. So, they call wrapping. Wrapping, you remember me, right? They do wrapping, they wrap. They wrap, they apply a layer of cotton, and on top of that, they apply. Uh, uh, compression bandages. So, compression bandages, uh, uh, we have uh, very primitive com compression bandages here. They are not elastic or elastic either, plastic either. So, they have dedicated uh, compression bandages there. So, we, if you talk about the bandages, there are short stretch bandages and long stretch bandages. Long stretch bandages are one we are having. At the how here, they know, I think, but there are short stretch bandages. It, you can predict how much pressure you can apply with that stretch. So, there are squares marked, if you, that is marked there. So, you know how much pressure you want to apply, right. So, generally we use for uh, varicose vein patients, we do class 2 bandages. So, it exerts about uh, 18 to 24 millimeters of uh, mercury from outside. So, after varicose vein surgery, those are class 2 bandages. Uh, that is recommended for varicose vein. Similarly, there are separate bandages uh, made for these patients with lymphedema. Then there are elastic compression garments like uh, these are, I, I was talking about the bandages, so there are garments like ready-made uh, stitched garments. Uh, they are also not available freely here, but uh, there are hospitals where they custom make them. They may take measurements of the limb because you can't uh, make a universal uh, garment uh, for patients. The different limbs are of different shapes. So, therefore, you need to take measurements of the limb, maybe arm circumference, elbow circumference, and then you have to make it, stitch it. So, there are candy hospital, there was one, uh, but I do not think now it is working. Right? And then also, there are in intermittent pneumatic compression devices where you apply it to the limb and you 
pressure is intermittently even if you use intermittent compression devices you need to use these compression bandages thereafter you can apply compression device and take it off and walk you need to walk with that compression bandage and there are various uh, pneumatic compression devices multi chambered uh, pneumatic sleeve devices and they they cause a softening of the fibrous tissue when you apply that intermittently the fibrous tissue becomes very hard so when you apply the intermittent uh, compression sleeve devices that softens the fibrous tissue so that further massaging further bandaging becomes fairly easy so this is one uh, garment they have ready made one they are patcha kotla we have some green mannequin like that we have these are available in other countries this is how the compression bandages are applied in a country like us like you know it's not easy you know how to how difficult to apply this it's very difficult to manage that is the problem with uh, lipidema management patient can't do any work you know, the person who is applying will have to spend about half an hour in applying that it's very difficult it's not easy therefore you should take all measures to prevent second lymphedema when you do mastectomy try minimal dissection and you know you do only on uh, really indicated patients so prevention is very important in treating uh, lymphedema patients this is again uh, uh, an intermittent pneumatic compression device applied to both limbs and uh, with a with a machine right i have blurred the face because you are not concentrating here so look at the <laughs> look at the look at the compression device <laughs> so when are we going to do surgical intervention surgical intervention is kept last when they are really indicated or if the non surgical intervention fails we do surgical intervention because surgical intervention i said it takes lot of time lot of resources uh, experienced people are needed i don't think in sri lanka there is anybody who is doing lymphatic uh, surgery um uh, the 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 uh, the non surgical management is the first line treatment right first line treatment is non surgical that is the compression uh, decongestive therapy so you do surgical intervention if you want to gain uh, very if the leg is cosmetically very bad you know, you know with surgical in, uh, non surgical intervention you can't get closer to a normal thing then you may consider surgical intervention right there may be may to achieve reasonable function if the limb is functionless then may may do surgical intervention right um, if there are recurrent cellulitis or complications again you may consider surgical intervention you should try to avoid it all the time right the surgical intervention is at a again very very primitive stage even in other countries this evolving very evolving field so what are the surgical treatments available one thing is physiologic procedures that is to facilitate the lymphatic flow the other one is ablative procedures where you remove the excess tissue those are the two uh, uh, ways of treating lymphedema what are the physiological procedures physiological you do surgery with the aim of maintaining lymphatic channels to to maintain the flow so uh, one thing is uh, suction as is a lipectomy you remove it. actually it's an ablative procedure i have by a mistake i have put it here we should come here right it's an ablative procedure vascularized lymph node transfer is one you take lymph nodes with the vessels and you anastomose so imagine uh, anastomosing a lymphatic so very difficult even micro surgery we do here with uh, loops and all by vascular surgeon so imagine anastomosing a lymphatic that that is done right there are various instruments available for that that is done in developed countries and then you do lymphovascular anastomosis you anastomose a lymphatic channel to a vessel it's very difficult right then ablative procedures the top man should come down uh, the suction as is lipectomy or liposuction is an ablative procedure and you sometimes use laser therapy and then ultimately you do massive resection of the limbs to remove the uh, chronically inflamed tissues from the limbs and in those patients uh, Uh, we may do ct or mri just to plan what to excise and which extent to excise those patients will be uh, will undergo imaging right so that you know which area the fat is more and so that that kind of things uh, whatever you do so you, you should continue with decongestion therapy surgical intervention ekak karat andimata arakat karanno nattam aayena right it's very important so need lot of sacrifice by the patient and the clinician as well so what are the drawbacks of surgical intervention surgical intervention is 
easy, not easy. It's a complicated, low procedure, right? It's high, it has high complication rate, and highly skilled surgeons are needed. Sophisticated equipment are needed, and there is no universally accepted algorithm which patients should undergo surgery. There is no black and white uh, demarcation, right? That is that depends on the clinician and the patient's request. So when I, when we are going to do lymphatic surgery, how are we going to image? I said imaging is reserved for patients who are going to undergo surgical intervention. So if we are going to anastomose a lymphatic through a vein, we should know where the lymphatic uh, channels are. So in those patients, you do this lymphatic um, mapping, right? You do endocyanin green lymphography and technician radio, various uh, things are available, and uh, it is done to visualize the uh, locate the lymphatics, right? like we when you do varicose vein surgery, we do duplex and see where the perforators. Uh, similarly, we do that to find out where the uh, lymphatic channels are. So this is one uh, the the endocyanin green lymphogram. This is an example where uh, they inject the material here in the webs, and then you do scanning here. Then. You do scan and you map it on the skin where it goes and you cut that over that area where you want to access and then you, you find the lymphatics and uh, again it is uh, you use um, what you call gamma probes to find out uh, the, the uh, uh, what you call radio activity right. So up to 2 centimeters depth like you can find out the lymphatics. Um, there are two patterns you get uh, when there is lymphatic obstruction. One is linear pattern, if there is no obstruction then high flow is there, the dermal block pattern if you see that, uh, that area you assume that is blocked. Right. Uh, then um, other imaging model it is radionuclide lymphose integraphy, uh, nothing much, I mean you inject uh, similarly uh, contrast and then uh, do scan. So when you when it comes to surgical intervention, it is not microsurgery; it is super microsurgery, right? So you are dealing with uh, less than 0.8 millimeter vessels to anastomose. So I have never seen them being anastomose. I don't know how they are doing it. Now we find it very difficult even to anastomose a bowel. So I don't know how they are doing it, but they are they are they are, they are doing it, right? Uh, so they do bypass a lympho lymphatics to veins and you know various uh, ways of anastomosing lymphatics that is they will evolve in other countries they are doing it. So especially if they diagnose lymphedema at a young stage, if the disease is progressing, the only way to stop the progression is to anastomose, do this kind of surgical intervention, otherwise the disease progresses. So therefore they do in young children lymphovascular anastomosis. So this is uh, how the anastomosis is done, you know they map where the lymphatics are, they then find a vein and then a the highlighted figure, the, yeah, they anastomose that this is the lymphatic which is blocked here, you can see small small tributaries here, the lymphatics are coming from there, here after they are blocked, so they cut here and anastomose here, this is a magnified beam, I do not know what they use to anastomose but they do it, that and it works. So, so lymphovascular anastomosis is a like a physiological procedure as I said, physiological may, uh, way of treating. Uh, that is done for stages 1 and 2, right, okay. So if you see the last uh, thing, there is no reduction on fibrosis and adipocyte hypertrophy, though even the lymphovascular anastomosis is done, you can't reduce the fibrous tissue, you can't reduce the adipocyte, adipose, adipose tissue load, you can't reduce, but they stop progression. Therefore, you, you choose that then for early diseases, stage 1 and 2 diseases where there is no permanent damage, you choose them at the very beginning so that you can stop the progression of the disease. This is one area where they, they have anastomose, this is a lymphatic channel coming here, they have anastomose to a vein here, this is a magnified view. The magnification is something I do not know, it is not just there, right. Next thing is that this is a lymphatic vein anastomosing, lymphatic channel anastomosing to a vein, the other one is the anastomosis lymph nodes with veins together that is called vascularized lymph node transfer, right. So you take lymph nodes with the vessels and they implant uh, maybe in the groin, maybe in the, at the ankle, right. 
So um, I think there was a picture there. You get uh, lymph nodes with the gray, the stomach. Uh, you can take lymph nodes and uh, results from here. In sample taken from there. Then they these the lymphedemeters put. They they implant here. So that helps to uh, stop progression of the disease. Right? That's called uh, lymph node and the vessel transfer. So anywhere you can transfer lymph node, right? So from the neck to leg, from abdomen to neck, uh, anywhere you can use them. Then uh, that is physiological procedures I talked to you on. Now the ablative procedures, um, if I call it, right, uh, let's talk about that, right. Ablative procedures, uh, the, when the physiological procedures are not working properly, uh, we may choose ablative procedures. They are very devastating, right. You cut off all the uh, tissues and remove them. You can combine those two together, implant, karla, apala, inkarana, pulo, right. So, the liposuction, right? Liposuction is thought not to damage that they think that lymph, node, lymph uh, channels are not injured by this. I really don't know about that, but it's what the literature says liposuction. It's a blind procedure. So, liposuction is a minimally invasive procedure with low risk. So, it's unlikely to further compromise lymphatic channels. channels. Right, so that's it. It right. can be done in conjunction with lymphovascular anastomosis. Those two can be combined. There are various excisional procedures, ablative procedures, Charles procedure. You do excision described by various surgeons. So this is one procedure. You excise and graft or whatever. These are excisions done. So this is one uh, limb treated by excision. Right. So this is preoperative, this is postoperative, good cosmetic outcome. But the problem thing is you need to maintain this. You, if you don't do the previously talked non-surgical methods, this is all going to come back. So post op also you have to maintain that. That is not easy. So this, this is the leg they have converted this, not bad though. It's like bedridden patient. And they are excised and uh, taken to this stage. So, post op management uh, again, I said uh, always we have to continue with compression therapy. So, if you do uh, lymphovascular anastomosis, uh, you need to wait for some time to apply compression, like one month. If you do like lymph node transfer or lymphovascular anastomosis, after one month you can start. Uh, compression therapy, but if you do liposuction, you can start immediately, same day, right. Then you have to follow up those patients. This is again another patient wearing a compression garment. So our treatment goals, again I am repeating, uh, improve functional status, the reduce dependence on compression devices. So when you when you when you do surgical intervention, the the compression devices, the maybe the time duration may you can reduce it, but you can't completely avoid that, and you can reduce the risk of infection also. There is an algorithm followed at some countries, but I don't think you can see. I also don't understand that. <laughs> okay, then I think that's all. Right. Thank you very much. If you have any any questions I can write if you have any questions if not we will go and go and <laughs> have a rest. Is there a way for prophylactic antibiotics in the current cellulite situation? Yeah, no, if the, now if it is uh, like like love you benzidine, penicillin you give for chronic uh, lymphedematous patient, same if they are getting recurrent attacks. I, I don't know the latest uh, guidelines how, how frequently you should get cellulitis to give antibiotics. I am not sure about it. But there is a place. So to get recurrent very frequent cellulitis, if these non-surgical methods are not uh, helping to get rid of them, yes. That uh, the frequency you need to uh, read the literature and see the latest guidelines. Okay, no, right. Thank you very much.
very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to give my uh, sincere uh, uh, gratitude uh, for the um, kind uh, acceptance of the, the, the lecture, which was in short notice. And thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, it was a uh, very interesting and very informative lecture. Uh, it is very clinically based, clinically oriented, uh, which would be very useful for you, for you all. Uh, and uh, appreciate your uh, keen interest on this topic and uh, taking a lot of time for this. Thank you very much for uh, the uh, lecture and the lunch both. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Mani Piris uh, and Dr. Ananda and Dr. Kodituak for taking their uh, effort uh, in maintaining technical assistance. And uh, thank you all for your uh, presence and uh, those who uh, joined via Zoom. Uh, and one announcement, uh, the next uh, program will be uh, like a clinical day uh, which will be uh, uh, like discussion on uh, three clinical based scenarios uh, in uh, three uh, disciplines of areas uh, so we'll let you know the date soon uh, and uh, <coughs> another thing uh, uh, i would say uh, sorry for the uh, last time lunch which was a bit unpleasant and which was in uh, beyond our control uh, anyway, uh, we'll try our best to have the lunch nice here. So uh, just try it, uh, and it's available here. Uh, that's it. Uh, okay, thank you for your for the presence, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Penny.